uh, David Jonathan Ross, who's now become a good friend of, of the archive, a good friend of the program. So it's always really nice to <coughs> have him uh, part of the events that we have here. So David uh, draws letters of all shapes and sizes uh, for custom retail typeface design. He's a native of Los Angeles, but uh, he began, and he began drawing typefaces at Hampshire College. He joined Font Bureau in 2007, uh, where he developed his type skills further. Now he publishes his own designs out of his own foundry, DJR, uh, as well as working on projects with Type Network and developing display faces for his Font of the Month Club, which is amazing. So please welcome uh, David Jonathan Ross. Hi. Um, I'm glad, before I load up my slides, I'm glad you get to see my, um, I customized my system font to the input, um, which I'm very proud of. Um, but yeah, so, oh, wrong slide. We're talking about variable fonts, but that's actually not where I'm starting. I'm starting at the high. Good. Um, so yeah, talking about this new thing, um, kind of exciting, uh, happening in the world of um, font technology. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, the OpenType font format, version 1.8. Um, maybe that's like a little dry and boring and I want this to feel exciting and interesting. Um, so let's just say I'm here to talk about variable fonts. Um, so yeah, um, in the latest version of the OpenType spec, so this is not a new format, right? It's a new version of the existing format. Um, a single font can contain within it multiple stylistic variants, allowing it to behave as if it were multiple fonts. Um, this was introduced a little over a year ago, was jointly announced um, by representatives of, let me see if I can get them all, um, Google, um, Microsoft, uh, Apple, and Adobe. And um, seeing this kind of collaboration is encouraging because like, you know, from, from big players because we're already start, starting to see support in their products. Um, so yeah, single file, many styles. Good? Um, so, I, so this talk, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the format. Um, I should say I'm not on the team that developed it. I don't work for any of the companies involved in it. Um, I'm just a guy who likes to make fonts and who has played with it a bit. And um, so I'll just like share some anecdotes and some information about the format that may be useful. But I really want this to be useful for you. So if there's anything I'm leaving out, um, please let me know. Um, but first, um, a little bit of context. Um, font families have been getting a lot more and more complex over the past few centuries. Um, and the earliest font families kind of came about by taking a separate style, you know, like, um, you know, here we see an italic used with a Roman, but, but the italic was not designed to be a secondary style of the Roman. It was just a contemporary style with a whole separate calligraphic tradition that it's based on. And, um, but people started to see the value in having a secondary style, and so they paired them. And then once they started pairing um, these two fonts, or these two styles, then there's a rationale for kind of designing them to be used together. And that's how the earliest uh, font families uh, came, came to be. Um, a similar thing happened in the 19th century, um, where we have a totally separate style that, that happens to be in vogue at the time. Um, this time, you know, a, a bold or a fat face or an antique, you can see. So, so this page actually uses an antique at the top and a fat face at the bottom, which is kind of a cool example. Um, but yeah, th there's kind of this pattern of, you know, designed and used independently, then paired together, and then incorporated into a family and designed together. Um, in the 20th century, we start to see this concept of a super family, uh, where you're combining uh, like a serif and a sans, and even, you know, like rotus and, and thesis, you get semi-serifs in between those. Um, but again, designed independently, paired, used as a family. Um, so your typical 20th century family, you kind of have like a, like a grab bag of styles, right? Each kind of filling a different role. You have your textile, your, your secondary text, your italic, your subhead, your titling, um, you know, and, and these were, might have all been produced, you know, kind of at you know, separate times. You know, like there isn't a cohesive vision, right? This, so this, this is Shado, uh, produced over the course of 14 years, just for example. Um, but you also start to see families like uh, Cheltenham develop where the, the intent of, uh, of the family is to be big and flexible. Um, 
So, I mean, like you can see this not so humble brag about Cheltenham's ubiquity um, simply because it's a big family. It's like, oh, it's so good because it's so big. Um, and like, yeah, at the time, this is a really big family. And you start to see kind of like, you know, a progression of weights, a progression of widths, um, and then italic variants, not only for the textile, but for the titling styles as well. Um, kind of all roped together under this Cheltenham banner. And this leads to like the obligatory slide that anyone talking about tight families has to show. Um, so um, I'm not gonna say the name of the typeface because I don't wanna be criticized. Um, <laughs> Uh, so um, anyway, uh, here we see like a more modernist approach, right? We're, we're exploring the concepts of weight, width, and slant kind of s more systematically. Um, so, so this is more of a series and less of a family, right? You know, each of these doesn't have a role. Like Adrian Frueger wasn't like, I developed that one for, you know, this kind of subhead, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is offering the, the graphic designer variations on a theme. And that kind of you know, brings us, I think a lot of um, tight families developed today um, kind of go along, you know, go in this direction. Um, Font Bureau is where I grew up as a, a type designer, so um, you know, I feel very connected to these typefaces. Um, this is Titling Gothic um, by, by Font Bureau staff and David Burlow. Um, so I, I, you know, at Font Bureau, I learned how to, how to work with these large series and how to appreciate what they could offer designers in terms of just like, rather than offering separate typographic roles, just like, here's some flexibility, you're welcome. Type, type approach to, to, to series. Um, so, and, you know, e so I learned to kind of like, you know, deal with that even though, um, you know, it could be years of work and to make like a buttload of styles like that. Um, anyway, so that kind of brings us full circle to today where we have this, um, this new font format. Um, and th this font format is well suited to that kind of variations on a theme style family. And, and, you know, again, it's more of a series. I, I don't know where we define the word series and family. Um, but, but, yeah, so, um, so, so yeah, we, we now have this font form that, that can kind of better accommodate the many styles approach to um, type design. Um, so, yeah, variable fonts. Oh, um, a word on variable fonts. Uh, let's talk lingo for a second, because, like, even though this is kind of a complex subject, this is the most common question I get is, what do I call them? <laughs> like, what, what's the words? Um, so I'm not an expert. I mean, I'm not, I can't give you the official word, but I'll tell you how I've been using it. I refer to the technology of having multiple styles in one font as font variations, and a font that has that technology as a variable font. Um, objections from the room? <laughs> okay, so I'll, now that I've defined that, I'll do my best to actually do that during this talk, but that's kind of, anyway, that's what, what I'm thinking. Um, so a variable font. In my mind, there are kind of three things it has going for it. Um, it's a more efficient way to store um, multiple variants. Um, it gives uh, designers and users kind of a, a, the ability to, to tweak things and to adjust things, and it opens up some interesting doors for um, responsive design. Um, so I'll, I'll just uh, get going. Um, so I think it's important that any kind of new technology that's being adopted, um, I think it has to be more efficient than the previous one in order to work, um, or in order to kind of pan out. I mean, it has to kind of offer some immediate benefit. And um, I won't get into the history of multiple master and um, GX, but it didn't have those, uh, these were kind of previous attempts to, um, you know, implement this kind of technology, but they didn't have that like immediate like, boom, this makes things immediately, like in an achievably in a real way better. Um, now with the web, we have that. Because we have kind of, you know, typographic palettes that may use multiple variants of a typeface like this, right? Where we have like a headline, a, a byline, a, you know, some emphasis and, y y I mean, that whole thing. And then we have um, on the web, the way we load fonts, you can call on a, on a font file and then use it in your web document. So. Um, Typographic, you know, so typographic palettes on the web are kind of limited because each time you want to load a separate variant of your design, you are calling a separate file. 
And each of those files contains its, its own outline data, its own kerning data, its own spacing data, its own metadata, and so forth. So you're kind of going back and forth from the server, grabbing these files. A lot of it might be semi-redundant information that you're grabbing over and over again, and then displaying that to, to the user. And um, this talk is also not about font loading. Um, I will just say font loading is important. Um, this is kind of like the textbook case of why. Um, maybe you start to see what's going on here. The italic font actually didn't load, and it should have looked like that. And um, kind of a different uh, situation. Um, yeah. Um, this actually, this specific situation, it, 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 there, there's a new property in CSS called um, font display, where you can actually say, don't have a flash of invisible text. Give, swap out a, a, a default font, you know, a system font, until the font actually loads, and that would help in this specific situation. But um, it's just like, yeah, font loading is important. On a website, we need to be conscious of how big files are that we're sending across the internet. Um, so yeah, if you're going to take away one thing from this talk, um, this might be it. Um, if you use more than one variant of a typeface, a variable font may save you some kilobytes. So here's kind of how that works. Um, the efficiency here comes from data that can be shared. So say we have a light A, and then over there we have a bold A. So before we were t storing two separate, these outlines kind of separately in separate files. But now we can store one outline and then plot the differences between them. And because the font contains these, di these differences, um, oh, so I should say, um, so we, we can then describe these differences as an axis, right? So this would be an, a weight axis. So we travel across the weight axis from light to bold. Um, and then once we have this, we can display any point in the middle of this. And, 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 and there's no actual added data in the font. It's just interpolation. It's just math. It's just going in between the two sets of points. And, and yeah, we can see any variant on that axis. Um, so how much do you actually save using a variable font? Um, that is a complicated question. <laughs> Um, so I don't, I, I don't, th there isn't a lot of data that I've found out there on actual, like, like what are the actual benefits. So I took one of my font family's Gimlet and made a bunch of variable fonts. And then I used my, my static fonts and kind of did a, you know, apples to apples comparison. Uh, so here are the results from that. Um, so say on this side, you have uh, your two styles, regular and bold. And on that side, you have a variable font that goes from regular to bold. So it's one axis with two masters, right, the, the, on each end. Um, so um, the, 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 the two in, in instances are, um, it, once I you know, subset them a bit, um, convert them to WAF2s, make them all web friendly, 33K. Um, any guesses on what the variable font would be? Uh, louder, please, so I can hear you. 30? 23. 23? 16? OK, OK, OK. A variety of guesses. Cool. I'm, I'm, thank you. I appreciate you actually guessing. Um, the answer? 31. OK. So I will forgive you for not falling out of your chairs out of pure shock at, at, the, at these file size savings, OK? Um, but 6% is not nothing. Right? It's still savings. Like, hey, like, you know, if you told me I saved six bucks, I'd still be happy about it. Um, okay, so 6% file size savings in this scenario. Let's try a different scenario. So now instead of two static fonts, I'm loading three static fonts, right? I have a regular, I have a medium, let's say I'm gonna use it for subheads or something, and a bold. So that's now 49K. And on the right side, we have, we have a variable font that can handle that same you know, that, that same coverage. Um, anyone care to guess on the file size for this one? <laughs> you guys are awesome. Why am I even doing this talk, right? You guys already know this. Um, yeah, it's the same. That's a lot of savings. That's 38% right there. So this is why it can, it can vary so much, why it's hard to say, oh, a variable font will save you X percent. Because it really matters how, like, like which styles you're using and whether you get those styles for free. 
because the variable font, will, will, you know, you'll have some delta sets, right? You'll have some variations across the axes, and that's, that's just data. You're, you're not going to save that much because you're saving the metadata, but not so much else. But then everything in the middle, they're, they're freebies. Um, so let's take another example. I'm not going to make you guess anymore. Um, uh, so yeah. This is also three instances, but now we've introduced a new axis, right? So our three instances are display and then our two text weights. On the other side, we have now a two axis variable font with three masters. So you're seeing a bit more than the original, right? So, you, so we're seeing like, you know, that metadata is now being shared across three fonts instead of two. So we get this percent savings. Not bad. I mean, like, you know, it's, it's not nothing. Um, but once we add a bold weight, we get a bit, um, we're now covering that entire zone, right? We can now get everything in between text and display and between regular and bold. Um, and, and we can get um, 16 on that. Um, finally, when we start to add those midpoints back, this is where the savings get really big. And you know, I'm just trying, you know, I'm trying to kind of like, what would someone use in a typographic palette, right? You'd have a few headline weights for some variation and then a few text weights. Um, yeah, this is 44%. So it's possible to save a lot. Um, I did not test a situation using multiple, using um, instances versus the variable font where the instances were actually smaller. So I think I can say, at least for me, the variable font will always save something. But yeah, it depends. So that's kind of essentially how you can take a whole mess of styles and kind of like squash them together into one font. Um, it's important to note that variable fonts are built to store variants, but not necessarily entire families. Um, so for example, you can, you can kind of take that, this typeface, but more likely, or in, in certain situations, it actually might be something more like this. If your Roman and your italic are kind of structurally different, um, you know, if the italic kind of has that more, it has a different serif structure, has a different curve tension, has, you know, is it actually a separate, more of a separate design than it is a, a, a variant of the, of the Roman typeface? It might be more efficient, it might make more sense to load it as a separate font, in which case you could load it as maybe a smaller variable font if you don't need an italic for every single Roman style, or as just single inst italic instances. Does that, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Okay, uh, implementation. Um, how can you actually use one of these? Um, so when I scheduled this talk, uh, the answer was pretty much you can't. And then as of like this past month, all of a sudden you can. Uh, so that's kind of exciting. Um, we're starting to see support in desktop apps. This is a uh, Photoshop uh, 2018. Um, so you can, hopefully the video is playing, awesome. So you can actually use sliders to go across uh, the, uh, what do we got, weight and width axes um, in this um, acumen um, variable font. Uh, and you know, live right in Photoshop. And this one acumen variable font file will actually appear in your font menu as multiple styles. So you still have those named styles, you know, your regular, your medium, your semi-bold, your bold, you still have those, right? But you also have the sliders on top of that. Um, on the web, um, there's a new CSS property called font variation settings. Um, so you have, uh, the way it works is you, you have your axis, and each axis gets a four letter tag. And then you have a numeric value that kind of says where along that, you know, plots the point where, that you want to display on that axis. Um, when you have multiple axes, no worries, you just put a comma there. And um, you'll notice that uh, the first example is in caps, the second example is in lowercase. Um, this is because the first example is what we would call an unregistered axis, um, which means I just made it up. Um, it's specific, you know, I, you know, I just said my font is going to have an ABCD axis because why not? And it's going to do this. And I can define whatever range I want from 0 to 10, from 0 to 1,000, from negative 1,000 to 1,000, whatever I think makes sense for my users. Um, on the other hand, a registered axis is one that we kind of try to have some standardization on. Um, so here are the registered axes. We have weight, width, optical size, italic, and slant. Um, so we can use font variation settings to access these registered axes, 
But the, kind of the, the cool thing about them is that we can also have higher level interactions with these axes via our normal properties that we use. I don't know how many people write, actually write CSS in here, so hopefully this isn't like whoosh. Um, but, but you know, font weight, you know, you could always say font weight is 400, 400 is regular, and you can have 100, 200, 300, all the way to 900. Um, now you can have font weight 372 if you just want it like a teensy bit lighter. And uh, that's something, so yeah, the options for weight on the web just went from 9 to 900, which is kind of a little bit exciting. Um, does this actually work? Um, uh, this actually, <laughs> variable fonts just got on Can I Use uh, last week. Uh, thanks to the work of Jason Pomental. Um, but yeah, you can, you can see that there's now support in Chrome, in Safari on High Sierra, and soon on Opera. Firefox, it, it has it, but you need to turn on, flip, on, flip a switch for it to work. Um, it's still in testing. And um, MS Edge is in development. Um, so yeah, you can see up in that, that right-hand corner, um, the global support for this is 7.8%, again. <laughs> Small percentages are not nothing. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> the theme of my talk. No, um, this is going to grow like crazy. I mean, I did a talk on this last week, and that number was 2%. Uh, because it's now, you know, like people are still, you know, that version of Chrome that is supported in was released three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Um, when people upgrade, it's just going to go up. Like, I mean, like, this is, it seems like this is actually happening. Um, and you can actually use this on the web today, even with 7% or whatever support. Um, here's how. Um, at supports, familiar maybe with at supports, it allows you to kind of say, if my browser supports this, then do that. And if not, do that, right? So we can say, I'm just going to kind of talk you through the CSS. Isn't, isn't talking through code fun? Um, we can say, if our browser supports font variation settings, just load the variable font. If our browser doesn't support font variation settings, load our, our specific instance fonts that we're going to use. And then either way, doesn't matter which, you can still refer to that font weight bold, font weight 700, whatever you want to do. Um, and if the, if the browser does support variable fonts, then you get those file size savings. Kaboom. Implemented. Um, anyway, so great. We have a font format that can do cool stuff like this. Um, very snazzy, very cool, whatever. What does it actually mean for typography? This, I think, is a more complex question. Um, and one that I think is still being answered because we're very early on in this whole, um, you know, the, the implementation and the, the acceptance of this format. Um, for me, variable fonts kind of represent an opportunity to um, reinvent the relationship between me, the type designer, and um, my user. Because um, I kind of see us, like I don't want to be cheesy, but like I see like the type designer and the type user as kind of partners in, in space management, right? We're working together to make typography happen. This is, this is all sounding kind of lame, I understand. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I'm kind of working on the micro stuff, like, like the stuff within the vertical M. So for example, I'm kind of doing a lot on, you know, like the actual, like what the letter actually looks like, um, like the spacing and kerning between the letters, the, the actual, like the, like the stem weight and the proportions of the letters, you know, like how, like the actual presentation of the typeface. And then you're kind of, are you assuming maybe you're doing, the, you're the designer in this, I know a lot of you also design type, hello. Um, but anyway, just bear with me for a sec. Um, the type user d uh, decides font size, line spacing, um, column width and, and margins, you know. So we're kind of we're kind of in this together, and um, variable fonts. Ha you know, there's kind of this this opportunity to you know take that line between our our division of labor that we have and kind of blur it a little bit, um, like that. Um, and uh, you know you know because now the type user can get much finer control over how the letter looks. And, and things like proportion and, you know, like, and it makes kind of like width and weight tweakable a bit. And at the same time, I as the type designer, I can kind of bake in my preferences of how, or like recommendations almost of how the design, I think that the, the design should be used at a specific size or in a specific context. You know, I have a lot more control over that rather than just giving you a big pile of 100 fonts and being like, here, use it, you know? Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that, you know, 
this is a way, this is kind of a mode of thinking that I am already very familiar with. And I think a lot of type designers doing work today um, already think in this way about their typefaces as kind of, you know, not as finite styles, but as axes kind of going in certain directions and, you know, kind of creating a multi dimensional design space. Um, I already think about things like breakpoints in my designs, like when does the crossbar or the dollar sign, you know, when is it get, when the letters get too bold or too narrow that I got to just get rid of it? You know, th this is kind of stuff I'm already working with. Um, type designers already have software that does interpolation. Um, we, we've been using it in our process for years. So it's not like variable fonts are that radically new from my point of view, right? Because this is the kind of stuff I've been doing for a while. It's not until the end of my process, the very end of my process, that I just like poop out a bunch of like, you know, discrete styles and I go and try to sell people, right? That's, that, you know, that happens, you know, usually towards the end. Um, so yeah, in a way, um, this format can actually offer us kind of a pure expression of, of the things that I already try to cover in my work. And that's kind of cool for me. Um, a brief overview of how I make these things. Um, if you want to know more, you can feel free to ask later. Um, essentially, I, I'm, I'm in a UFO-based workflow, unified font object, and so I take my separate files. I have my default file that's going to be the default for the variable font. I have the variants I want. I create a design space file, um, which is kind of, for those of you who use Superpolator, kind of like a Superpolator file, but also kind of not. Um, and then I run that through FontMake, which is an open source tool um, from Google. And uh, using that, I get to type that into the, the terminal, which makes me feel like a hacker, which is fun. Uh, and then it, it spits out a variable font if I'm lucky. <laughs> and that's kind of my process. Um, so a design space essentially is where I, as a type designer, are, am kind of defining the axes and pointing it to, to which files I'm using, and then also defining the named instances. So I can say, you know, the medium is halfway between the regular and the bold, stuff like that. Um, and that's kind of how I put things all together. Um, so I'm just going to talk, uh, give a few anecdotes about the kind of like the tweakability and the responsiveness aspects of this. Um, yeah, so um, tweak tweaking fonts is cool. Um, I will tell you about my font input, which is kind of where I discovered the power of tweakability. Um, and I designed input for um, writing code. And I kind of thought that I could make the ultimate coding font, um, one ring to rule them all type situation, because there are a lot of coding fonts out there already. Um, it's free to use for code editors, so go download it, have fun with it. Um, turns out that this was a slightly hubristic um, there is actually no ultimate coding font um, because when you're, do, when you're setting type for yourself, it's all about making things comfortable. You know, programmers are looking at the same font day in, day out, um, and what they like is maybe, like whatever they like, that's what they like, and that's what a good coding font gives them, right? So all I could do as a type designer was just give them the options to make informed choices about their own coding environments. So like if you're kind of like a mathematical academic programmer, you might have like, you know, very few lines, but you know, a lot of typographic complexity. Um, if you're, I don't even know what this person would do, <laughs> but you know, you might, you, you, you might have different demands on your font. If you're coding on a narrower screen or you're doing multiple columns, you might want a narrower font. If you're coding, um, you know, I, depending on the kind of code you write, you might want to see more or fewer lines at a time. Um, Weight is a big deal when you're talking about different colors because um, on a black background, the regular weight will appear very differently than it will on the light background. Um, so I actually, you know, you kind of developed a matching system, right? So on a black background, you can kind of get the equivalent using one weight lighter, if you can see that on this, maybe. Okay, cool. Um, so anyway, input kind of ballooned into this massive family. We had sans, serif, and mono versions, um, monospaced because um, stylistic options are important. We had um, seven different weights, um, and then we had four different widths. So yeah, it got, oh, um, italics. <laughs> um, it got big. Um, and yeah, it's like ridiculous to like dump 168 styles onto a person. And so um, I got uh, Nick Sherman, hello Nick. Um, and Chris Lewis uh, to build this awesome little interactive website where people could actually drag sliders and kind of customize their own coding environment. Um, 
And yeah, so you could go across way. You could even customize the line height, which was, which was kind of cool because it involved going into the font metrics data and like tweaking that around. Um, but yeah, it's a lot, this is kind of a lot more intuitive when you're dealing with a big set of fonts than like choosing them from, from like a ridiculously long menu, right? And then you could go and you can you know, customize all the alternate forms if you want the slash zero or the dotted zero. Um, I mean, we, um, we really got way into it. Oh yeah, the curly brackets were super controversial, so I had to make an alternate for those. And then you can download your own version of the font. Um, so yeah, tweakability. I mean, like if, if I had variable fonts then, this would have been a lot easier, right? Um, tweakability is important. Um, thinking of other, other you know, kind of you know, stylistic changes that you could make to type. Um, this is a Dunbar by CJ Dunn. Hello, CJ. Um, I believe this is the first commercially released variable font. Um, and it's a great um, example of a font that uses an unregistered axis. So like here, you, you can actually vary the X height from kind of like, you know, 1920s geometric smallness to like 70s, like big X height, you know, ITC style. Um, it's really cool. Um, it's actually playing the video, right? <laughs> Maybe it did. Um, anyway, uh, so I mean, so, so you can kind of take designs and express things where that were not really previously, maybe previously possible with a bajillion style family, but certainly not practical, right? Um, another one of my colleagues that has been doing a lot of uh, intense stuff with this is David Burlow, um, really trying to take this format and push it to its limits. Um, so all of these different styles that you're seeing are all in the same font. These are all an in interpolatable font. And um, using this cool tool, Axis Praxis, um, you can actually test this font. Um, uh, David Burlow, the work he did, uh, he did with Google, so it's all open source. Um, and you can go and you can actually combine the axes, right? So I did weight and flared right there um, to create um, you know, possibilities that even David Burlow himself did not you know, imagine, perhaps. Um, he did the same thing with it with a text font um, called Amsovar. And this is kind of cool because it shows the potential for variable fonts to carry forward the, the idea that, that we've had floating around for decades of parametric fonts, right? Where you can take each, you know, you can take like the height of the lowercase as one parameter. And you can adjust that independently of any other thing. So you can adjust the weight independently of width, the width independently of weight. Um, and, and so you can theoretically come, you know, come up with any combination. And so a variable font does not need to be parametric, it's important to say, um, but variable fonts create possibilities for parametric design, which are exciting. Um, I also like fun stuff. Uh, this is Eric von Blockland's jam, where you can you know, just change the quality of the typewriter grittiness um, using ax like variable axes. Um, super fun. Uh, Axis Praxis ha is doing a pretty good job um, keeping tabs of the variable fonts that are out there. So this is actually an old GX font, but let's just well, let's just let that be. Um, anyway, uh, you can, uh, so you can go play with all of these um, at that website, so it's cool. Uh, responsiveness, I have two little anecdotes about uh, responsiveness, but the idea with responsiveness is like, if web designers, and primarily web designers and app designers, are designing layouts, right, that will expand and contract to fit a, you know, a phone or a watch or a desktop monitor, um, why would the letters they use not expand and contract as well? Um, the first kind of responsiveness I'm gonna talk about with is um, optical size. Um, probably a lot of you have seen slides like this where you're showing off, you know, like, you know, in metal, um, optical size was just built into the design. They were designing each font you know, each size had its own property. So you have like a very fine, high contrast, large versions, and you have very ruggedized, tough, wide, loosely spaced, you know, text versions. And, you know, so each, each you know, and then in, in digital type, this kind of all got flattened out into this one digital outline that could just be scaled. Um, so variable fonts kind of give us this opportunity to kind of come back to that size-specific design that has been a part of type history that we've only lost in the past, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, I mean, you know, it's not to say that we don't draw optical sizes, but we draw them as separate fonts, so we have to trust our users to actually use them. 
Um, so as an example, um, I did a revival uh, of a font called Forma for a fashion magazine. Um, this was done with Roger Black, and he really liked that, you know. So this font was originally done in 1968, and it had a really cool kind of ink on paper feel to it. Like if you can see, if you look really closely, those stems aren't quite straight in this in this printing. You can kind of see like they're a little tapered, right? They're like, you know, like the corners aren't totally pointy. They're a little rounded. Um, you know, so it has this like, organicness that maybe like your normal Helvetica, you know, your digital Helvetica doesn't have. And it also has this cool, you know, late 60s, early 70s, like tight but not touching um, approach to spacing, which we, which we tried to capture in the digital version. The problem is, is that these things are super sensitive to size, right? What is tight at five point and what is tight at 50 point are totally, two totally different things. So we ended up drawing five optical sizes, five separate families. Um, and you can see here all of, you know, not a ton, like not gigantic differences, right? But subtle stuff and subtle stuff matters. Um, of course, it was very hard to convince our client that it was worth the trouble to go through and actually make sure that they were using the right font at the right size in their magazine. Like this is like a pretty thick fashion magazine and they just weren't going for it. Um, so we got um, our colleague Kent Liu to make an InDesign plugin that I called the Font Police. <laughs> where um, it would just say, hey, uh, you're using the wrong font for the wrong size. Uh, do you want to fix that? And then you could say, Ch skip or change. So imagine this going for every single text box in the entire document. Um, needless to say, the client did not use this. <laughs> um, but we made it, and it should have been easier. Uh, and now with variable fonts, it is, right? On a like, you know, if you have a browser that supports it, um, this is all it takes to use optical sizes with, with a variable font, right? If, if your font has an optical size axis, um, depending on the font size that you use, it will find that point on the axis and show you that font. Um, and you can see this, um, th you, you can demo this just by comparing a browser that uh, supports variable fonts with a browser that doesn't, and the browser that doesn't, you just see the default font over and over and over again. Um, in, in, the, in, in the browser that supports it, you actually see like the, li the line length gets a bit longer. The, it's maybe hard to see on this, on this slide, sorry, but you know, the contrast gets lower, the X height gets larger, the spacing gets looser. And, and you can, we can, I as a type designer can really tweak things for size specific stuff and I can trust my user will actually implement it because it takes no effort. And that's kind of cool. Um, my last anecdote um, about responsiveness um, is the width axis. And the width axis is super fun um, because, uh, you know, distorting and squishing type is super fun. And we've all been trained not to do it. But like, there's a reason people need to be trained not to do it. And it's because it's super convenient to do it, right? Um, of course, the problem is, is that it actually distorts the letter forms. Um, so, you know, this would be a better condensed, right? Um, so I was like, okay, could I take this concept further and make a font that's like designed to fit any context? Like regardless of what you type, regardless of what, where you're setting it, the font will just fit that space. And with variable fonts, all of a sudden, that was possible. So I made this font called Fit, um, filling space with maximum impact, um, legibility, obviously not, not a goal, right? Okay, we're all clear on that. Um, one, of, one of the taglines I came up with was, difficult to read, impossible to miss. Um, but yeah, so if you can look at the white spaces though, they're equal across all these three lines, but the actual stem weights change, and that's what allows you know, each, of these, each of these three lines of text to occupy the same amount of space. Um, and to get meta for a moment, um, I'm giving a presentation on a projector that has a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Were I to give this presentation again on a 4 by 3 aspect ratio, my letters would squash appropriately to fit that screen as well. So that's kind of cool. Um, anyway, uh, so you can, you can take one letter, three letters, four letters, on and on and on. Um, Easter egg, that's the Hebrew version I'm working on with Oded Ezer. I was wondering if anyone would have noticed if I slipped it in there. Um, um, narrower, narrower, and intensely narrow. Um, so yeah, uh, this is a lot of A's to go into a single font. Um, and so with that variable font, um, my collaborator Chris Lewis and I made this site where you could actually do 
active squashing where the design is not destroyed. Um, this is just a piece of JavaScript where it just, you, as you drag the div, it just recalculates the appropriate axis value for that width. Um, um, because variable fonts are not yet super widespread, and when I released this earlier, definitely not widespread, um, we did a fallback system where we actually generated 1,000 static fonts. Um, and so the JavaScript will actually dynamically call those up if your browser doesn't support variable fonts. And so this presents us with um, one of the more extreme, perhaps the most extreme, file size savings comparisons <laughs> that you can have. Um, OK, let's do it. Um, 1001 WAF2 files is about 20 megs. Um, do we have guesses on the variable font size? 31. <laughs> 31. <laughs> um, so actually, pretty dang close. Me <laughs> too. Um, yeah. So uh, that's fit. Um, I, I released it in January to um, pretty much uni universal acclaim. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this is like the favorite thing, uh, my favorite thing anyone has ever said about my work. Um, <laughs> because he also said this. And like, I appreciate that because. What, what this commenter saw in his own special way is that this typeface was not about like, providing a readable solution, right? This was about you know, seeing if a variable font, like how responsive it could be. Because that same principle that I didn't fit, you could take and you could do in text to make actual real responsive design, right? So in this example, I have my font Gimlet again, where I've actually taken the mobile version and I'm using a slightly narrower text version so I can get a word or two extra per line. Um, subtle stuff, um, but as we saw with the percentages before, subtle stuff makes a difference. Hashtag typography. Um, so yeah, I can have different, um, different widths of my text. Not, you know, usually widths are a thing associated with display fonts, right? But I can have different widths in my text, and then I can just implement this on a website um, using a media query. Right? So I can have just a breakpoint and say, at this breakpoint, show, show a width that's slightly narrower. At this breakpoint, show another width that's slightly narrower than that. Um, here's my, everyone's got to have a dragging of the browser example. Um, so this is mine. Um, ready? Oh, did you see it? Oh, oh, oh. Right? Breakpoint? Okay, again, again, again. Oh, breakpoint. Um, so, so that's, you know, actually, you know, your font is changing as your column is changing. Um, and that can be done you know, with not a ton of additional page weight because it's variable. Um, you can also get with width into kind of fun, cool experimental stuff, you know, solving some of the problems that um, you know, kind of have kind of annoyed typographers for, for centuries at least. So like if you have a headline that just like doesn't really work out, you can kind of just make it a little narrower until it fits on the two lines, right? Um, you know, this is, this is stuff that like, you know, you've always wanted to just squoosh it a little bit, but now you can do it without destroying the font. Or take uh, justified text, for example. You know, this is justified text without hyphenation, right? So I mean, we're gonna have pretty big, fat word spaces. I can kind of like compensate for that a little bit by adjusting the, the width. So I'm not actually proposing that like we sit here and do this manually, by the way. Uh, sorry if that's not clear, um, that would be, Sorry, no. Um, I'm saying that like algorithms could exist to do this if a font has a width axis, right? Um, or say like you have a ragged right, um, but but you just kind of kind of have an ugly rag. You can kind of just say, oh hey program, make that rag a little nicer, and wouldn't that be kind of cool? Um, so yeah, efficiency, tweakability, responsiveness, variable fonts. Um, I'm going to just say a few other, th before wrapping up, I'm just going to say like a, kind of a few other random thoughts that I've been thinking about a lot with variable fonts. Um, so here we go on that. Um, they're not all or nothing, meaning just because a variable font can have a huge multi-dimensional design space doesn't mean it has to. Um, font of the Month Club uh, people will know that uh, the, last, uh, the last font of the month uh, was uh, Papadale, which has uh, just a contrast axis, just like a little bit in contrast. So just to make, just to give you a choice, uh, this is not some big, massive weight width 
slant you know, design space. Because you know, I'm, I'm actually very interested in the, the idea of micro axes as like a thing, because I don't want to give my users this, right? That's not my goal in being a type designer. Um, you know, choice stress, like I, I don't, I don't want to offer my, my users choice stress. I want to kind of empower them to make good decisions and kind of make those tool, tools available. And I would love it if those tools didn't look like this at the end of things. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is where being an early adopter in, a, in, in, a, in something like this can be super valuable because, you know, like, like the story of how these tools look and feel is still being written, and so we can be a part of that, which is exciting. Um, the other place where variable fonts don't have to be all or nothing is um, font licensing. Um, there isn't a ton of precedent. Um, for how variable fonts are going to be licensed, because I think only a handful are available for sale. Um, there's uh, Dunbar by CJ, there's Fit by me, um, and uh, Underwear has a uh, Zeitung. Um, and in those cases, I think it's pretty much like, you know, if you buy the family, you get the variable font. Um, but you could also have a situation where if you buy a part of the family, you get a variable font, font that covers part of that design space, right? Because once you have all of those you know, masters working together, you can combine them in any configuration, even configurations that don't exist in the original variable font. So if you want to have an axis between the com directly from the compressed light to the wide bold, you, know, you can do that. Um, so that is a, you know, that could make font licensing a little bit less complex than saying like, you have to rebuy all the fonts and it's going to be a lot of money and, you know, it's going to be a lot of effort for type designers to create. Um, Another thing I've been thinking about a lot is that a variable font is only as good as its default style. Um, it's like, you know, you can have a dish and you can serve the dish with, uh, you know, salt and pepper or sriracha or Tabasco or whatever, but like the original dish should still be good. And what I don't want to have happen is, you know, this kind of stuff is cool and distracting, right? But it is also a way for people to reissue their old boring fonts as new boring variable fonts. And I don't want it to prevent you know, like new interesting work from getting out there. Um, which brings me to my next point. Not every font needs to be a variable font. Um, so this format, like if you're making a big unified design space, right? If, if you're doing a variations on a theme type family, why wouldn't you offer a variable font? Like, it's going to save your users at least something. It's going to make their life at least easier, like, in, in one or two contexts. Like, it, it, it seems like, to me, that seems like a no-brainer. But not every type family is that, right? I mean, you might have type families where there's a, there's a, a lot of difference for historical or for aesthetic re reasons between the regular and the bold. So don't offer them together. Or, I mean, like, you know, I, as Sasha mentioned, I've been having a blast with my Font of the Month Club. And, you know, the, the fonts I'm releasing for that are kind of like smaller designs, one-offs. And I don't want to feel pressure as a type designer to add unnecessary variants just because my users are expecting them. Um, you know, I've been having a blast doing this stuff, and there's no reason for font formats to get in my way. Um, I should also say, there's a lot going on right now in uh, font tech. Um, so it's kind of cool to see variable fonts evolving and starting to see support alongside um, a couple other notable things. Um, the first being color fonts. So you think that um, variable fonts have a potential to, you know, give designers power to make really tacky things. Um, <laughs> this is going to be worse, <laughs> but, but, uh, but also very cool. Um, because, yeah, you can actually put SVG images or other kinds of color data directly into the font. And this might lead you to ask, can I have a color variable font? And the answer is yes. Um, this is an experiment I did with uh, Roll Neskins. Um, it's a uh, poop emoji with a variable cap height. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're hilarious. Um, <laughs> So I think that this is now working in High Sierra in Safari, and I think that's about it. Otherwise, you might see a variable font that isn't in color, or you might see a color font that isn't variable. Um, but it is possible. I don't know if it's a good idea, but it's possible. Um, the other kind of very exciting thing in web typography that's happening is a CSS Grid, um, where designers have freedom to, to kind of create true responsive layouts with columns. Um, this is my favorite CSS Grid example, which is a responsive Mondrian painting. Um, this is by Jen Simmons, who's done a lot of great work on CSS Grid. Um, so yeah, the, so yeah, these three things together 
are going to make web design especially, but design in general, really grow as a, as a medium and give us the opportunity to do things that weren't really possible in the past. Um, so I think it's about time for me to shut up. Um, so I'm going to end with a um, little quote from this book, uh, The Art of Hand Lettering by Helm Watzkow. Hope I said that right. Um, this is one of my favorite mid-century lettering guides. It's a lot like most of your other mid-century lettering guides, text and examples. Um, but 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 all, a lot, most of the examples, a lot of the examples. Of course, I'm not going to find one now that I'm up here. Okay, here we go. Um, have this uh, have this quote that he says over and over again. Always endeavor to find some interesting variation. Um, and I like that a lot um, because, I mean, you know, you know, he's talking about variety in a single piece of lettering. But I think this also kind of applies to how we use type in our compositions. Um, you know, we're on the cusp of having innumerable variations at our fingertips. Um, but variable fonts are a mean, right, not an end. Um, so they should really, I mean, like they have the potential to kind of like flatten out tight families into like these you know, soulless clone armies, or they have the potential to like ha give us like unprecedented typographic exploration. Um, so we can make our readers' experiences maybe subtly better. We can make our page loads lighter. We can give designers more options to make the designs interesting. We can give users more options to make our content accessible to them. Um, so yeah, in exciting times like this, um, a, littering, a little interesting variation never hurts. Thanks so much. So I think we can do questions. Love it. <laughs> um, uh, Nina in the back. Hi. Um, Hello. Thank you. Uh, I, I the, what you just said about the soulless clone armies really made me made me laugh and I was, this is a thing that I think about a lot and it's um, that you opened up also with this kind of historical precedent of how families kind of have been keeping getting more homogenous in the way that you describe universe as modernist and that's, that's maybe a bit of a weird question but do you think variable fonts are inherently a gateway to a modernist kind of conception of what a, what a type family is? Do you think uh, we're going to kind of automatically now go further down that path of kind of the conception of a, of a family? Um, maybe. I think it changes the incentives, right? I think that with a variable font, all of a sudden you now have an, an actual incentive, like from a, just like a purely file size point of view, not to mention like the actual like amount of work it takes point of view, but like from a file size point of view, your web designer will save space if you're regular and you're bold, interpolate. So that's going to encourage you to, to make your regular and bold more similar so that they interpolate um, easier. Um, but from a design perspective, you might have an incentive to make, make your regular and bold a little more different. I mean, Times New Roman is a you know, very famous example where the regular and the bold are like two very different designs. And, um, you know, we, I, I mean, I think we've already seen a trend because of apps like Superpolator and just like how much easier it is process wise to make fonts that interpolate easily. But like the, the truth is, is that like, like not all designs interpolate the same way. Like some designs may require more masters along an axis than other designs. Like if you have a, a very, like, like kind of like a mid contrast serif tends to interpolate really well, right? Because you don't, like, when, when you're looking at a letter, you kind of see, like, the differences. Like, you see the difference between thick and thin. So, like, in a low contrast form, if, sorry, I'm not doing a great job explaining this, but um, if you have, like a, like, a crossbar of an E, like a lowercase e, for example, right? In a black, that might get very, very thin because you're running out of space. But then when that interpolates across the medium, that will look weird if it's just raw interpolated. And normally, I would fix that in the medium. But now I have to put it in a master, and now there's an incentive against me doing that because that's adding file size for my user. So yeah, I, I think it's continuing a trend that's already existed, um, for better and for worse, maybe?
Hi. Um, Hi. Are the font variation settings all animatable? Like if you put a transition on like the font weight or font width and had like an interactive change, would it you'd be able to see that, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, I think that's very cool. Yes, okay. it is. So I didn't have more examples of that. Um, yeah, so like if you wanted to like your your like you know on hover state to rather than just go from regular to bold to actually like animate from regular to bold, yes, you can do that with uh, uh, keyframes, right? Like CSS keyframes. Is that? Any oh yeah, any transition. Yeah. Hey, great talk. Um, so I thought, yeah, I thought it was interesting, your response about um, changing the incentives, right? Um, which I think it's good to realize that how the, the format has certain things that it does, you know, it incentivizes, but that like designers can choose to work with or against that and still, you know, make interesting designs and not just like um, soulless, you know, clones or whatever. Um, and also it's um, th with your uh, size saving example, um, it's nice to see like how you can save file size even if they're, if, if you're not, um, if you don't have a bunch of like uh, interpolated instances. So like even if you put the, um, like you, between a regular and a bold that you put a, like a medium master, you can actually still like save in between that. So um, it's, it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to have these like extreme jumps and um, there's ways that you can get like subtle savings even um, in between them. So uh, sorry, comment, well, not question. Well, um, um, <laughs> if I can respond, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I, can, so I'd like, I can, I'd like to I can rip on that. Um, I mean, I think what we're gonna need to see are tools for doing that kind of subsetting. I mean, one of the things I didn't talk about is that, you know, in all of this, there's, you know, support that's going to have to happen. You know, users are being introduced to a new format. Uh, designers, type designers, are having to make fonts in a new format. And I, you know, I worry that the onus for both of, the, like, you know, su supporting both of those things are going to fall to the foundries, right? All of a sudden now, not only do I have to make the fonts I've always ma been making, I have to make variable versions. And I have to offer my users tools for using those variable versions or subsetting them to the reasonable minimum size. And um, you know, I would, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see the open source tool development that's happened already. And I really hope it continues because we're going to need it to have that kind of, you know, thing where you can kind of, you know, build your own variable font to match your specific needs. Um, because if you have the, you know, if you're loading every time the font that has the weight, the width, the optical size, the everything, that's that doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't think. I have another que a question. Actually, is do you have any axes that you haven't seen, but you are you want someone to, you know, Ooh. secret axes that you would reveal? I think wow. Eric Van Blockman talked about like secret, like mystery axes, and I'm curious if you have any like dream axes that you like that may or may not make sense. <laughs> Nightmare yeah, axes. Um, see, this is where I should have like a really funny answer, and I don't. Um, I'll think about that one. Sorry. Um, I know you've talked about memory and how big these things are, but I was wondering about like time, like in terms of the requests and stuff like that, and the JavaScript that people are using to adjust that. Have you looked at that, like seeing? Oh, like in, in the matter of seconds? Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't. I, th I, I think it just varies a lot depending on the connection speed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not a font loading expert. Um, like, there might be other people in this room who could speak to that better than I could. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fair to say that fonts are probably not going to be the largest thing loading on any given page. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, you think about images, you think about videos, you think about, like, all, like, the sketchy ad JavaScript that's, that, like, all the, you know, companies are using to track you and do all these helpful things for you. Um, what, what fonts tend to be unfortunately, is the most expendable asset being loaded because you can have someone say, oh, well, they can just use the system fonts and it's fine. Yeah, and that's no load time, right? So, I mean, we're competing with free, essentially, uh, which is a hard thing to do. 
Um, so you know you have to have a, a developer that says like this is important, this is worthwhile. We're going to load these, and so if we have a font format that makes it easier for them to do that, mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing. Um, t seconds, I don't have that data for you. Sorry. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. Uh, so you showed an example of um, when there are custom axes, how to access those via like CSS. Um, I was just curious for um, like other programs like Photoshop, if there's some way that they can pull in uh, all of those custom axes instead of just having the kind of standard ones like width and so on. Like if I just had you know something in Photoshop, do I have to like write my own plugin for that, or do they just show up? Um, so I think here I'm going back to that slide. Actually, actually, might be faster to show you in actual Photoshop, but let's see if this does it. Um, so if you go to the, the properties box, do you see there? Yeah, yeah. Um, so like you can, I mean, so is that kind of what you're asking about? Like, so 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 so, so any 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 axis I put there would okay. show up there. So so things like font size would actually be could actually be like hard coded into like the font size selection thing, but like the arbitrary axes like um, you know like jiggle or I'm trying to think of like some fun, um, bang yeah bang is a, that's an actual axis uh, from Eric's font right, um, uh, yeah so like that would all show up for now in that palette. Um, if you wanted a different interface to get at them, because you know, I mean, I think that there's an argument to be made that sliders are not always like the best way of getting at, a, especially like across a, a large range. I mean, I think sliders can be great. Like, say I want to, you know, select my medium from the menu, right, and then say, okay, my medium a little heavier, a little lighter, right? That that's great for sliders. But from doing a slider from like super duper thin to extra extra black, it's like it's hard to be precise. Um, so that would be maybe a plugin, unless uh, Adobe has some things up their sleeve that I don't know about. Um, and I don't, I haven't seen uh, desktop support from a lot of other apps outside of the Adobe apps, um, so I can't speak to those either. I, I would be happy to leave that to Adobe and everyone else to figure out <laughs> write my own plugin. Thanks. Sort of same question, but about like, would that eventually be an Illustrator? option? Um, like it is in Illustrator now, really? I think. It's not in InDesign um, <laughs> because it's like, you know, that's how, that's how it goes. But it is in Illustrator. It might be, I'm not going to make any promises about InDesign. <laughs> um, but yes. Am I, am I right there? Oh, no, no, take off the hood. Am I right there? Yeah? Okay. Good. Just want to make sure. Adobe people. <laughs> going once, going twice. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>